This lesson deals with a piecewise time domain example. You can find these notes in the ECE 202 ebook in chapter 8, starting on page 26. In our last video, we took a look at this RLC circuit, and we found the current in the inductance, the current in the capacitance, the current in the resistance, and the voltage across the resistance in steady state. And in fact, the values are listed up here above. What take a look at in this video is what does it mean to be in steady state? Now, in this example, we had 100 cosine of 2000 T. In the piecewise program, there is no cosine function, but there is a sine function, and you can have a phase shift with it. So I need to figure out whether this is plus or minus 90. So let me take a guess. I'll put down plus 90 here, and the way I check it is to let t equal 0. Now I have the sine of plus 90. So when you have a plus phase angle, that means you shift the waveform to the left. So I'm going to be shifting the waveform a quarter cycle to the left. That's going to put the peak at t equals 0. And of course, that is what a cosine function does. Go look at writing the piecewise file. So I need a title. I'll call this example A10. I need a dot end. I need to describe the schematic and then give it some control commands. Got a voltage source between nodes 1 and 0, and an inductance between 1 and 2 with a value of 250 millihenries. If you recall in SPICE, uppercase m or a lowercase m means 10 to the minus 3. Capacitance is between 2 and 0 has a value of 0.5 microfarads, and then a resistance between 2 and 0 and a value of 3000. So for the sine function here, we have several things that we can specify. First one is the average value. This is the area underneath the curve for one period. We're as much above zero as we are below zero in one complete cycle. The peak value is next. In this case, it's 100 volts. Next one is the frequency in hertz. Now we know the frequency in radians per second, so we're gonna divide that by two pi. The next one is called a time delay. We can actually delay the start of the sine wave. The next one's called a damping factor. This is an exponential envelope. The damping factor is the reciprocal of a time constant. So I don't want my sine wave decaying to zero. And so by making the time constant infinite, or the damping factor is zero, it's just simply a pure sine wave. Then lastly, the phase shift of 90 degrees. That probe will save and plot for us all the voltages and currents in our circuit. And now the transient response, so dot tran. And we've talked about this in 201, but let's go over it again. The term here is the final value of the simulation. It's where it's gonna end. So let's plot, say, six cycles. So I take the period, which is one over the frequency, and multiply it by six. I'll show you that in six cycles, we basically reach steady state. I'll divide this number by at least 200, this is called a print step, and you'll get at least 200 points of graphed on your output of any voltage or current. And then lastly, we're going to pick what's called a ceiling step to equal the print step. And I'll show you in a little bit why we're doing that. First thing I want to take a look at is what does the input look like? It's supposed to be a 100 cosine of 2000 T. It's always a good idea to check your input, because if this is wrong, then everything else you're going to look at is wrong. Here's my node voltage 1, and sure enough, I've got a cosine function. I've got one cycle, two cycles, three cycles, four cycles, five, and then six. Maximum value is 100, minimum value is minus 100. If you take the time from here to here, get the reciprocal of that, you'll get 318.31. I didn't mark it here, but that's exactly what it is. Take a look at the output. This is at node voltage two. And you can see that the waveform is changing, but eventually starts repeating itself. Each time this peak value gets a little bit lower and a little bit lower, and eventually approaches 189.75. This is what we call the transient response in ECE 201. This is what we call the steady state response. That's what we're predicting with our phaser analysis. We're not calculating this, but calculating this. We'll learn how to find this, but in many cases, we don't really care about this. This is what we're going to be hearing or manipulating our circuits with. We also had phase angles, so let me do the following. Plot V1 and V2 on the same graph. So you can do a multiple graph in one printing. When we talk about our phase angle, it's in steady state, so it's with respect to the input. So let's take where we're roughly reaching steady state, and I'll call that time t equals t0. The value is 100 volts, and the time here is 15.682 milliseconds. Now with respect to that instant in time, where is v2? Well, that peak is shifted to the right. That means that the phase angle is actually negative. Okay, the peak value here is 190, and it occurs at 15.861 milliseconds bottom of the page, do a calculation then for phase angle and magnitude. Well, the magnitude is pretty easy. So I have a magnitude of 190. Well, let's calculate the phase angle. A little formula here. When T1 equals T0, in other words, there's no phase shift, then I'm going to get 0 times 360. So here's my value of my start, and here's my peak occurring at call time T1. So the difference of those two divided by the period is what fraction of the period that I have. And I put the sign here such that if I'm shifted to the right, I'll get a negative value. If I'm shifted to the left, I'll get a positive value. Let's evaluate the formula. 
T0 is 15.682 milliseconds. T1 is a little bit later at 15.861 milliseconds. And my period is 3.14159 milliseconds. Multiplying that by 360, I get minus 20.5 degrees. So my voltage V2 is 190 at an angle of minus 20.5. Now we had calculated this to be 189.75 at an angle of minus 18.435. The reason these two aren't exact is that I really haven't truly reached steady state here. I need a few more cycles, but it made this picture look kind of crowded, so I just stopped it at six cycles. Let's do the same thing for the current in the inductance. It is with respect to our input signal. So again, let's plot V1 and mark roughly when we reach steady state. And then with respect to this peak, where is the peak for the current? In this case, it's shifted to the left and occurs at 15.201 milliseconds. So I think we can calculate the phase shift by our T0 minus T1 divided by the period times 360, and that's 55 degrees. The peak is 200 milliamps, and so that's my magnitude and my angle. Now we had calculated this to be 200 milliamps at angle 53.13. And for the amplitude, we have the exact value. The phase angle is getting pretty close. It's about two degrees away. So a little bit more cycles here, I would get exactly the same values. I also marked the value of the current here towards the end of the simulation. I'll talk about that in just another page or so. I thought it was 124.885 milliamps. Let's likewise find the current in the capacitor. So I asked for I of C here. You can see again in steady state with respect to T0, I'm shifted to the left. That occurs at 15.107 milliseconds, and the peak value is 190 milliamps. I also marked the point here towards the end of the simulation. It was 65.119 milliamps, and we'll talk about that on the next page. So again, we can calculate the magnitude and angle of the phaser. Magnitude is 190 milli, and then the angle would again be the difference between T1 subtracted from T0. T0 was 15.682 milliseconds, and then we had 15.107 milliseconds divided by the period times 360 gets 65.9. So my current as a phaser is 190 milliamps at angle 65.9. Now we had calculated this to be 189.71 milliamps at an angle of 71.565. So again, we're approaching the value in steady state. Again, a few more cycles here would make this more precise. Do the same thing for the current in the resistor, ask for it to plot that. You can see here that the waveform is shifted to the right, and so it's a negative phase angle. The peak here is 63 milliamps, and the time was 15.861 milliseconds. Once again, mark this point here at the end of the simulation. It's about 59.766 milliamps. T0 minus T1 over T times 360, I get a minus 20.5 degrees. So magnitude was 63 milliamps, angle minus 20.5. Now we calculated this to be 63.25 milliamps at an angle of minus 18.5. 435. So again, pretty close. It's a comment here about the fact that if we ran a few more cycles, we would have uh, closer and closer to the values we hand calculated. I also recorded the value of some of the currents at 18.839 milliseconds. Now, if you take the value of the capacitor current at that instant in time and the resistor current at that instant in time, you end up getting 124.885 milliamps. We also measure the current in the inductance. If you go back and look at our first schematic, the current in the inductance is equal to, at every instant in time, the capacitor current plus the resistor current. You can see that exactly happened here. Now when I added up these two measurements, I got the other measurement. I want to make a point here is that Kirchhoff's current law holds at every instant in time for every circuit. Now we also did this thing with the ceiling step. We talked about this in 201 a couple times, but here's the reason why we specify what we do for the ceiling step. In our simulation, we specified a start time and then a ceiling step. Now, if you don't specify something here, the default is zero. But if you don't specify the ceiling step, the default is the final value divided by 50. What the program is going to try to do is to run faster. In the early days of computing, we paid per minute for CPU time. And this artifact is still in the program. Now, if you take this and divide it by 50, you get 376.9 microseconds. So what's happening with the print step, it's going to be giving me at least 200 data points. We divided this number by 200. When the program is running, if it sees a fast change in the waveform, it'll actually squeeze this number down. You'll get more than 200 points. If a waveform is not changing dramatically, PSPICE and SPICE tries to jump ahead and see whether the answer hasn't changed a lot, particularly like in a DC problem. So here you can see that there's these straight line segments. And what happened here, if you measure this one right here, you get 376.5 microseconds, pretty close to what 150th the value is. That's happening over and over again. And the program's thinking that the answer hasn't changed a lot, and so it just connects them up with two points. So if you don't specify the ceiling step, 
you may get fewer data points on the screen. And this is not what the circuit does at all. This is simply an artifact of the simulation. Surprisingly, there's very few textbooks that ever talk about this. And I've seen textbooks actually measure distortion on waveforms like this. And what you're really measuring is numerical error. So for any simulation, we're going to specify the ceiling step. And I want to just pick that equal to the print step. And I'll pick my print step at least having a value of 1 200th of the final value. So I can guarantee a smooth graph. And these are some of the properties of P-SPICE and time domain solutions and steady state.